So I want to welcome everybody to our presentation today on a feature in SOLIDWORKS Professional and Premium called Scan to 3D. And it's one of those features that comes along with the software that those who use utilize a lot, but a lot of people aren't aware of. And we just want to put a little bit of focus on this. Now, uh, my name is Darren. I've been around for a long time. So any of you who have seen these presentations before, I'm sure you've seen these next few slides. But mainly, um, I have a job in SOLIDWORKS, but that really just affords me access to the tools. In my real life, I use SOLIDWORKS more than I do day to day. So I do a lot of home projects, whether they're you know creating things, utilizing functionality like weldments that we have in SOLIDWORKS. Um, whether it's proving out something that I want to build or just visualizing the concept like I do when I'm any, doing any type of remodeling at home, um, I'm trying to prove out form, fit, and function using the tools. And what I need to do and what data I have accessible to me um, are really kind of a, a game time decision when it comes from one project to another. I spend a lot of time inventing things um, just because I can, not necessarily because I need to, but it affords me some stick time on the software to be able to do a pet project and you know, be able to, to learn with SOLIDWORKS and hone my skills while still you know, creating something that's necessary for my home use. So I encourage any of our customers to have access to the software at home through either the home use license or online licensing where the login follows you um, to use SOLIDWORKS whenever possible because it's just going to make you a better user. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about how to get data from other sources and uh, utilize that in SOLIDWORKS for whatever your downstream goal happens to be. And that's a pretty open-ended statement there. Now, when we're talking about these types of things, I'm really just trying to answer questions. And it really doesn't matter what topic we're discussing. It's about, you know, what are we trying to do or, or answering the what, how, and why. Now, for our particular purposes today with this topic, first thing we're going to do is just talk quickly about what is Scanda 3D and just make sure everybody's aware of this tool. Um, next, we're going to simply talk about why would you use it. And the why is everybody's decision. Uh, this is going to be an individual thing based on what you have and what you need to do with it. And of course, that's quite open-ended, but we'll cover a few of those workflows. And then, okay, how scan data can be used. Um, we can bring it into software, of course but I want you to see the methods to bring it in for the particular downstream goals that you might have. So that's what we're going to do today. Try and complete this in about 30 minutes or so. So first of all, what is Scanda 3D? Well, there's something called the waterfall effect in SOLIDWORKS, and this affects a tool like Scanda 3D. And what it comes down to is that years ago, um, we've always had these SOLIDWORKS professional and premium tools. Once upon a time, they were called Office. And once you get above standard, where all the modeling functions um, exist for SOLIDWORKS, you get some of these other utilities. And these things allow us to speed processes, do niche applications like tolerance analysis or feature recognition or part costing. Now, from 2014 on, we've had this thing called the waterfall effect, which has allowed some of these features that were in upper level bundles to sort of drop down into bundles um, that are more utilizable by um, other people. So I'm trying to let the animations work on this, but um, the animations aren't really flowing on the... Uh, um, there we go. They're flowing over our go-to here. So some things dropped down into 2015 to make premium and uh, separately sold products available to professional and premium users. And that happened again in the 2016 product. What this leaves us with is a tool that used to be in premium called Scanda 3 d which is now available to anybody with professional and premium. And this trend is a continual thing. So um, you'll see that happen from release to release continually. So Scanda 3D is available to everybody at a professional and premium license. Now, what is the tool really? Well, it's about data acquisition and scanning hardware has become more and more available. Uh, obviously technology is blossom, but the, um, you know, the, the market share of different types of technologies, not just the data you're acquiring, but the methods of doing it. And then the prices for those tools are coming down rapidly. Now, some of the data I'm going to show you today, I actually acquired using this uh, fairly ancient uh, Next Engine scanner. And it's about 10 years old. So, uh, you know, in terms of technology, that's pretty old. Uh, but handheld scanners have, uh, have really gotten very good technologically. They have good feedback. They acquire data points quickly. And uh, it's a good experience for the user. You, many times with these handhelds, don't even have to take the part you're scanning off of whatever you're scanning, uh, if it happens to be part of a vehicle or something to that effect. And then, of course, with uh, things like tablets, we've got now hardware that can uh, bolt onto those to acquire scan data as well. And this could use multiple camera points of view in order to stereoscope or, or 3D effect on those, those features. 
We've also got full booth scanning. Now, some of these are for more, um, you know, consumer use, uh, maybe just a, a little 3D model of a person. Uh, others are things that we see every day down automotive assembly lines. They're scanning the quality of the uh, a vehicle, the body lines. Um, we have a customer here in the Detroit area that does this uh, with SolidWorks. So we've moved into the drone age, and scanning has become less of an individual part thing and now more of topology and and you know checking out property lines. And the data acquisition is simply the same stuff. It's just applied to a different medium. So the way that we get our data is, uh, is kind of free and open-ended depending on what you need. The hardware is inexpensive, it's easy to use, and the quality is incredible. Now what this data creates, or what these tools create generally are point clouds and mesh clouds. And this is where the scan to 3D feature in SOLIDWORKS Professional and Premium come in. The extensions that you're using are things like IGIS and text. When it comes to a point cloud, these are just XYZ points in space. So line items in a text file with um, you know, three reference points where a point would exist. The mesh files are a little bit more elaborate. And what I mean by that is that it's not just points in space, but those points are connected by um, vertices or, or lines essentially that create facets. So those are more of an enclosed or surfaced looking type of a, a body instead of a point cloud. Now, both of them come from scan products, but for the most part these days, um, scanners and their post processors can create mesh files. So I'm gonna start off showing you a point cloud, but really we're gonna quickly get into um, data that's above and beyond that because the technology we have these days is, is really uh, fast tracking us towards the mesh files and getting this data into 3D solids or surfaces quicker. So why would we use this? Well, mainly, that's a question for each of you. Uh, a lot of times I've seen customers that are dealing with uh, historical parts. Uh, I had a customer a few years ago that had a broken brass gear uh, that was almost 200 years old from a mill. And without CAD data, the, uh, the gear needed to be remachined. So we had to reverse engineer from a good tooth on that gear, and I'll do something to that effect today, in order to then build a fresh gear from scratch. Um, because in that case, not only was it a broken part, but it was so old that no CAD data even existed. Now, no CAD data existing, uh, you know, that could just be that you don't have access to it. But a lot of times we need to utilize these types of parts uh, for our design, which means reference geometry. Now, you, I'm sure I've seen commercials about uh, products like this. But we take existing products, um, maybe a, an automobile or a truck that we don't design, and then we can scan the interiors in order to get the proper envelope to design properly fitting components, things like floor mats and bed liners. Um, we've even got companies that'll scan the inside of a van in order to build it out with cabinetry. So it's great to be able to get some of these reference points that you don't want to spend the time to either uh, measure up very manually or um, try to acquire that data from the original source in order to build things accurately uh, around that existing data. Now, another thing I see quite often these days is the attempt to compare the manufactured data. So scanning a part off the end of the assembly line, uh, whether this is from a coordinate measuring machine um, or a 3D scanner, uh, but to compare directly back to the CAD data. So a next level inspection, if you will. So that's a great way to figure out whether things are being machined to the way the design was intended. And then the last really kind of refers to all these above, but is skipping the modeling process. Um, sometimes it's a purchase good that you need to represent in your assemblies that maybe you don't want to spend the time modeling. Uh, it comes from a data source online. So there's a lot of different things where you just skip the process just to get a body in space, and these files will work very well for that as well. All right, so let's see how this stuff works. So I'm going to start off with a couple of different things here in some live SOLIDWORKS demonstrations. And the first thing I want to do is really just expose you um, to some recreations of these CAD files from reality. Now, what this is going to entail is a little bit of a gear file here to create um, some teeth, but I want to show you a couple of the methods that we utilize for this. Before I do that, though, I'm going to go into SOLIDWORKS and actually open up a point cloud file just to give you a representation of what these look like. Now, a point cloud file in our purposes came from a text file, and I acquired this from a customer, one of my friends, uh, Paul DeWise, over in West Michigan. And uh, he's got a very high quality scanner here, which provided me with a propeller point cloud. Now you can see what a point cloud looks like. As you zoom out, the points are almost so close or merged together that they appear to be solid. But as you zoom in, of course, you're gonna see that this is really just dust on the screen. Now this particular file has roughly 2.7 million points in it. And of course the quality is made by the hardware and the settings um, from the acquisition. 
But essentially, we have a file here that has uh, lots of data points, and we could utilize some techniques to get rid of these. Now, I brought this up simply because this is one of the only real samples I have of point clouds. And that's representative of the fact that uh, most of the scanners these days are creating mesh data so we can skip to that process. When or if you would receive a point cloud, you simply right click on it and we can go into some mesh preparation. When we don't have a mesh, this is an essential step and it will allow us to take the point cloud and it will orient the model. So if it was scanned at a particular angle, then it might put it into a plan view for us. We'll cover some of that later. But it also allows us to do things like noise removal, um, take a bunch of parts and points out of there, or in more important situations, maybe take 2.68 million points and maybe drop them down to something a little bit more palatable, like 37,000. Now, in this particular case, I'd really, really prefer to have the scanner set to a lighter precision so that it still acquires enough data points at the proper resolution, but doesn't bloat my model. Um, doing it here in SolidWorks gives us an opportunity to scrub this, but again, I'd rather have the data from the source be quality without me necessarily making these assumptions. Um, this does allow us to go down to a point where we can start to skin this a little bit better. But even in this case, uh, 376,000 points is quite a bit of data to deal with. So not necessarily something I would look for. Um, that being said, this would go ahead and construct the mesh. Now I'm going to cancel this process because we don't want to sit here and watch this. This one takes about 10 minutes to go. But what you'll essentially get is a faceted skin connecting all of these dots together. So as you can imagine, SOLIDWORKS is generating a line between each point. So for every point pair, there's a line, they make a triangle, that triangle makes a facet, and then that facet makes a mesh. So 376,000 points is gonna equal, um, pretty much triple that when it comes to, or excuse me, a third of that when it comes to facets. Um, still a very heavy model. So this is something that these days, we really don't see as often. So I wanted you to be aware of it, uh, we can go through the process, which is fairly time consuming with that many points, um, but these days is less and less necessary. So we're gonna jump to the next part of this step. Now, the next part that we get in this step is really about dealing with the scan data itself as a mesh. And when you do a file open inside of SOLIDWORKS, this is where your choices happen to be. So by turning on scan to 3D in Office, or SOLIDWORKS Professional Premium, you'll see the two scan to 3D mesh and point cloud methods uh, down here at the bottom. So what we're gonna do on this one is open up an STL file. So in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and use um, the file open technique to make this happen. And we'll grab our gear file. Now when you open it up using scan to 3D techniques, the mesh file that comes in will come in um, as what's known as a simple mesh. Now the simple mesh is different than something I'm gonna show you a little bit later where SOLIDWORKS will treat an STL file differently based on a setting. But for right now, what we're looking at is essentially the faceted version of the point cloud that you saw before. When you look closely, you can see the facets. If I turn on my wireframe, you'll definitely see the facets. And based on the amount of points acquired, we'll determine the quality of a part like this. Now, my goal on these is, uh, is twofold, usually. Um, the previous customer I referred to that was trying to recreate a gear, we really only need a portion of this model. And that will help with both performance um, and just simple um, palatability. So I'm gonna take the mesh that's already created and I'm still gonna run my mesh prep. What this affords me is a couple of other steps that I might not normally get. Now, when I look at this file, from the front view, it's actually skewed a little bit. So one of the things I like to use my mesh prep wizard for is actually orientation. Uh, you can generally select references if you wanna pick a couple of points on a face to orient this, but automatic referencing on this one works pretty good and it puts my part in more of a plan view. The other part about mesh prep on this one isn't necessarily the creation of the mesh, but it's removing some data. So I'm gonna do some extraneous data removal. Now, when I'm trying to recreate a single tooth, I really only need a little bit of data out here. So generally what I'll end up doing is getting rid of more than I need. So I'm gonna go ahead and simply um, grab around on this part and put a lasso around some of this data. And by doing that, what it will do is acquire all of the points and facets inside that lasso. By clicking delete, I remove a bunch of the overhead. Now that said, I'm gonna do just a little strategic lasso here and get rid of the rest of the part too, because with a tooth, if I recreate one, then I can go ahead and pattern those in SOLIDWORKS. And that looks pretty good. So now I've got essentially what I need, which is a single tooth set over on this side. Now once I'm done with this, I don't really need to smooth, which is another operation here where you can smooth this out a little bit by taking some of the faceting away. And uh, in this particular case, it'll also allow me to fill some holes, but I'm gonna jump directly to my surface wizard. 
And this is generally where when you're opening up a prismatic part, you have an opportunity for it to create primitive entities. And I'll show you where some of those settings are. But generally we're looking for um, this guided creation, which is gonna go ahead and create things like cylinders and cones and uh, planar types of surfaces and even some, uh, some B-reps. So as we're going through this, we have an opportunity to go ahead and either have it automatically detect these things, which on a part with geometry such as this, it, it's not gonna do a great job with, um, or we can go ahead and actually manually paint the things that we want to detect. So with my goal being grabbing just a couple of the faces off of this part to grab a gear tooth, um, what I'm gonna do here is manually paint things. So an opportunity here for me to differentiate visually is to change the color and then I can just simply go ahead and start painting on a face to grab some of these facets. Now, I like to stay within the face because overlap to an edge might uh, change or skew the way that that, that boundary is going to be uh, created. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of different colors and just paint a couple of adjacent faces. And in the end of the game, my plan here is to go ahead and extend these surfaces and trim them to each other. So that one didn't quite get what we're looking for. That's pretty good. Now, if you bound an area like you see there with that orange, and then we need the stuff on the inside to be the same, we can just paint bucket that facet on the inside and that'll become part of the same mesh. And then last, I'm gonna grab some of this channel right down here in the bottom. Let's just grab a little bit of, uh, get some aqua there, and then just some basic painting. And this might create a fillet or the radius that's at the bottom that I can then go ahead and generate um, as a real feature. So once I've got some of these facets mainly um, manually painted, I can either manually extract things or I can just grab those different mesh regions and choose the type of geometry I want. Now these are fairly organic, so I usually jump to a B spline, but there's a possibility that a ruled or a revolve type surface might work for these. And then primitives up across the top again, as you can see. So cones, cylinders, planes, spheres, and a torus. So with this one here, we're just gonna do a B spline. Now B spline puts a really nice representative boundary surface in there, and that creates some really good smooth geometry. By selecting another face and doing another B-spline, and then again, the, the blue that I did down the channel here would do one more, it gives us some pretty good data off of each of those faces. Now, there's going to be more work to do, of course, and more than I'm actually going to complete during this session. But as you see, there is some mesh that we have left that we can hide, and then left over are the faces that we've now mapped from our features. Now, if I wanted to go full through this, we would end up doing some operations where we extend some surfaces, maybe give us a little bit... Um, a little bit more distance off of each of those so we could then start to trim things and then we would merge these surfaces together in order to create what would be a cut with surface um, to create our gear tooth but essentially that is a simple method to very manually um, very deliberately go ahead and grab the faces that you want and determine a nice smooth surface from those now i have a different method that i like to use with this as well so we're going to run that method i'm going to simply open the same file and in this case, again, as scan data. So we'll grab our gear. Now the gear is gonna come in one more time here as a mesh, but I don't need to do anything with it for my next method. And this is something that I use quite often. Um, we are gonna prep this slightly. What I mean in this case is just for orientation's sake. I'd like to automatically orient it so that when I'm looking at a front view, I'm looking at more of a planned view. And that's good enough for me. So we'll simply kick to the end. And in this case, my goal really isn't to go ahead and try and create surfaces. So I'm not gonna launch the surface wizard in this case. What I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna right click on the mesh and I'm gonna launch something called the curve wizard. Now the curve wizard is a way that you can create what are essentially intersection curves. And that's a sketch tool that we have in SolidWorks, uh, but this automates the process. What it allows me to do is create cross sections by putting simple planes that are parallel to each other at different intervals through the part. Now the tool automates this by allowing me to choose instead of discrete curve methods on um, things like sections. Mm -hmm. And all that requires is an existing plane and then a point at which to start our parallel offsets. So in this case, I'm gonna use an existing plane out of my feature tree. And since I've spent the time to reorient it automatically, one of my existing planes is at a nice plan view to the orientation of the gear mesh. The point that we choose is really where we want the first insertion plane to take place. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on one of these gear teeth and kind of pick it a little bit up and above where fillets might exist in this region. And then what it will do is simply put in parallel planes at whatever interval we choose. So over here on the left, we can obviously change the spacing. And then in this case too, if we don't need quite as many planes as we're seeing, maybe some of the stuff up top is unnecessary, we can simply knock down the number of planes that we're actually using. So we'll just do a couple for our purposes here. 
Now what it does is it creates an intersection curve at every point which this plane intersects the mesh model. And the quality of that intersection curve is related to how quality or how um, tightly we have this curve fit. So over on the left, if you select any of the previewed curves in the selection tool, you'll have an opportunity to use a slider to make this a little tighter fit. And like a spline or a fit spline, um, this is something that I like to move more or less all the way over to the right. But you're going to want to do some visual trial and error just to make sure that this thing is fitting as tight as you require. I'm going to use both of those splines for my next operation. So I'm just going to select through until I see it. And then we'll tidy up both of those curves. Once that is done, I really don't need the mesh anymore because my goal was to recreate that tooth just like I did before. So we can take that mesh and simply hide it, and we're left with a 3D sketch where those intersections took place. Now the other thing with the sketch is that it's fully editable. It's related to the part, at least through the initial creation, but there's a lot of extra stuff here I don't need, so I can at any point go through and delete those if necessary. But what I really need to do is just check the geometry that it gave me and create my solid. This is done very easily through just doing a simple loft operation. With a loft in SOLIDWORKS, I have a single 3D sketch that I'm referencing, but through the operations of using our selection manager, it allows me to simply pick individual pieces of this sketch. So by picking a single closed loop on this feature, we'll access that feature, and we'll pick this feature, and it will loft from one of those to the other. And that gives us a very smooth, very quality lofted feature through two cross sections taken from the data itself. Now the last thing I've done on this one, well, that's not giving me what I'm looking for, the last thing I've done on this one is I want to go ahead and uh, let's do one more on that one. I'm going to use some open curves on this one. That's better. Um, so we're going to loft between the two of these. Sorry, we'll do that one more time. Um, we're going to use one closed loop in this one and one closed loop in that one. Okay, that looks pretty good right there. So that generates my gear teeth. And again, these are very smooth. The performance was much faster than the process I chose previously. And in this case, I've acquired virtually the entire gear instead of just a portion of that. So it's a pretty cool way to be able to recreate the exact same type of shape um, inside of a part like this. So looks great. The other thing that I use this for often, and this will sort of dovetail into another one of my particular pet projects, is the ability to build something around existing data, whether you've created that data or not. But we want to be able to accurately reference it without necessarily going through a lot of manual regeneration, um, putting micrometer or calipers on something or you know, trying to as accurately depict it as possible through normal measuring means. So when we reference things, a lot of times I like to use my scanner for this. So the next engine scanner that we used here um, I use for this little pet project here, which is a remote control uh, car body. Now I bought a kit to go ahead and put headlamps and tail lamps in it, but what I didn't have were the actual headlamps and tail lamps that you see down here to the left. So that's where the process of using a scanner allowed me to control my own destiny, make my own parts, and then inevitably here 3D print those. So this is the process that I'd like to go ahead and run you through so you can see the steps that maybe you would take in order to go ahead and acquire some data from something that exists and then go ahead and build your own parts um, accurately off of that data. Back into SOLIDWORKS. So what we have here is the assembly that I just showed you here, which was my left rear tail lamp. Now, of course, with SOLIDWORKS, we only need to go ahead and create uh, one of those parts because I'll simply mirror that to the opposite side. But the goal of this was to be able to create a part that would contain very easily a small LED light, which I've also modeled because obviously having the model there allows me to more appropriately build and create features to uh, contain that model. Very easy to reference. So the process that we took here was bringing in scan data. Now from the next engine scanner, it's a unique thing. It actually brings in the scan data as a mesh cloud, but with an additional benefit. So here's the raw scan data that we acquired. Now we did this by painting up the part a little bit because the part was a bit reflective and that's just the way scanners work. But as you can see here, as I turn off my mesh wireframe, we also have a texture applied to this. Now it's not the most beautiful looking texture. I've since painted the body um, a complete red. But in order to acquire those points, we needed to go ahead and actually put that on there. But this particular scanner and many others will actually lay a JPEG image over the mesh, which is how you see scans of people that actually have their physical facial features on the scan data um, colorized and accurate. 
So this is something that's a neat little feature and in my case actually allows me to see where the boundary of that tail lamp happens to be so that I can draw things properly. It's not a necessary thing to see. You can hide the texture anytime you want and deal with just the raw data. So in this goal or this feature, I, I determined pretty quickly that um, because of the highly stylized contours in these areas, that the curve method is most likely going to be my best success. So what I'm going to do on this one is simply right click the mesh and without having to do any prep, just simply jump right to creating curves. Now the curves in this case using my section method required a plane. So I've got a plane in there at a pretty good angle. We're going to use that in order to go ahead and create our sections. And we can start the section points or the curves anywhere we need. And I really only need data in this area. So let's just go ahead and minimize our domain and put it exactly where we need that to be. So we use a few extra profiles here and then obviously tightening things up is going to give us a better quality in that area. Think of this as the mesh that you might do when you're doing a simulation. Once I have what I like in this particular case, that's going to leave me once again with a 3D sketch. In order to simplify what we're looking at, we're going to hide the mesh and let's just leave us with those ISO lines. Now the great thing about a 3D sketch is that it is a single sketch, but I can use it for a lot of things by grabbing individual entities out of it um, to be used on the fly as individual curves or boundaries. In this case, I'm going to utilize the SOLIDWORKS boundary surface tool. And this is a real simple method of just grabbing each of these rails. So by picking the first one that we have here and saying OK, all I have to do is continue to select, right click, OK, select again, right click OK, and rinse and repeat. As long as I'm picking these near the top edge, it's going to synchronize the points that it has at the top to the bottom, and my loft should look nice, or in this case, boundary surface. So that gives me some quality data off of what was once faceted mesh data. At any point, I can still right click and show that mesh data over top of it, which would give me the opportunity not only to see the mesh, but if the texture was there, I could also see exactly where I need to draw things. Now this is where SOLIDWORKS really starts to shine. Not that it hasn't already, but we've got some great features that dovetail and enhance these types of methods. One of which we added quite a while ago called Spline on Surface. Now my goal here is to create a part that references this particular shape. I can pull this off very quickly by simply drawing directly on my surface. Using the Spline on Surface, all I have to do is simply click around the face itself and I can go ahead and draw as if I'm drawing on a piece of 2D paper but in this case, I'm actually drawing on my 3D surface. You can see if I roll that around, it looks like I've just dropped a piece of spaghetti right there on that contour. Now it is a 3D sketch, which means I can drag these points around. We can change the orientation and the angle of attack, and we can modify this as necessary in order to fit the shape. For our time constraints today, I'm not going to go too detailed into this, but I think you get the idea. Again, turning on my mesh and my textures would give me the exact boundaries that I want to reference with this particular shape. The beauty of SOLIDWORKS is the ease that we can combine and create things. Here is sketching and 3D surfaces, and then I'm going to combine that with just a very simple feature here. We're going to do that by using one of my planes. In this case, I'm going to use my front plane, and I want to go ahead and put what is the base assembly point for this, uh, this rear um, tail lamp, and that happens to be where that LED light is going to kick into it. So on this plane, I'm simply creating a sketch. These are all very basic things at this point, but that's about where I want my LED to be. Now all of that said, what I now have is a 2D sketch and a 3D sketch in space. And that enables me in SOLIDWORKS to use either surfacing or solid techniques to go ahead and create lofted features. By going from a 3D sketch to a 2D sketch, we create incredible dynamic types of geometry by referencing the topology of that surface. Now this particular shape, Going through the whole process would allow me to then go ahead and thicken it and then add the necessary geometries for creating the interior and exterior features. A little too thick there, that looks pretty good. And what we now have is a piece of solid geometry that once complete will go easily to my 3D printer and becomes the reality that you see in my slideshow here in the lower left hand corner. So bringing in just a piece of what we need to reference is quite a sufficient thing. And keep in mind, this is never an all or nothing proposition. You pick the pieces you need for what you need to do. Very good process. So the last thing I want to show you here before we finish up is another common method that we're seeing more and more where we're comparing what we're actually building to what we designed. Of course, that would um, diagnose or, or bring light to any type of manufacturing flaws, whether it be in just simply the tooling or improper in end mill. 
um, or just simple things out of spec. But it enables us to find these problems before they become much larger problems. Now what I'm going to do on this one is simply take a SOLIDWORKS CAD file and then bring in an STL file and compare those together. The process I want to show you on this one though is slightly different than what we've done so far. And it has to do with some technology that we added in SOLIDWORKS 2018 called mesh modeling. In this case what I want to do is say file open to grab my STL file. But um, the proper way to do this in order to get something referenceable is to import this now not as a scan to 3D feature but as a mesh model. Now mesh model is something that every SOLIDWORKS user has and I'll show you in the closing slides. But this also enables me not only to read the STL file as a body, but as a solid body, not just a graphics body or a mesh like we were seeing with our scan to 3D tools. By actually bringing it in as a solid body, what we get is still a faceted piece of data, but it's something that has mass, it has volume, you can put textures on it if you want to. It actually has some capabilities here um, that are a little more above and beyond what an STL file would actually entail. Now that being said, I've also got the SOLIDWORKS CAD model that this thing references. And the CAD data itself is going to be 8 decimal place accurate, unfaceted, and fully clean data. So that would be basically the difference between um, one model and the other in a lot of cases is just the accuracy of the scan. Now by having both of these files open in SOLIDWORKS, excuse me, by having both of these files open in SOLIDWORKS simultaneously, what we're going to do is compare the two to each other. So let me just quickly save this first file. Now I can do a process in SOLIDWORKS that we have called Geometry Compare. And this is a tool that we have with our SOLIDWORKS utilities that allows us to overlay two pieces of geometry automatically. Now what I found in this circumstance is that the accuracy of my STL model had an effect on how the difference between the two models happened to be um, when it came to the pieces of geometry it was creating that were different from one to the other. So obviously the scan quality is going to have an effect. Another method that I use quite often without doing that though is just simple overlay in an assembly. So we'll take a part, we'll make a brand new assembly from that part, and we'll simply insert that part into the origin without selecting anything. Now that said, if I insert component again and I grab the STL import and do the same method, it overlays those two parts on top of each other. And in this case you can now see that if we take a look at the facets and, and how these things look overlaid, um, we basically see that those two parts are mapped identically to each other. A little bit of hide and a little bit of show from one to the other. Again, there is our STL model, and then there is our SOD model over top of that. So those two parts, we can do a join, we can do a combine, or any type of cavity operation to see what the differences are as well. Um, but visually, we can see that these two parts are identical to each other, at least as way as manufacturing um, specs out. Now, I thought it was important to bring up mesh modeling because of this operation. Mesh modeling was added to SOLIDWORKS 2018 because of the proliferation of these types of situations. Uh, faceted data coming from lots of sources where maybe you don't need CAD data or features, but you do need the geometry. Now in this case, we're seeing other things where people are either creating artistic renderings where maybe you want a humanoid inside your assembly based on these types of input methods, um, or even what we're seeing dental-wise these days with not only scanning and recreating, but also 3D printing of teeth. In any event, the data comes from lots of sources, whether it's the scanners I showed previously or even CAT scan data, which is literal 3D geometry that we can import or print from. Now in this case, scan to 3D is something that is only in SOLIDWORKS Pro and Premium. All SOLIDWORKS licenses have the ability to just simply read models as mesh models. And that would allow you to open it up in the method that I've just done. Um, we can run through and acquire things like uh, cylindrical faces, planar faces directly from those mesh models. And there's no need to do the mesh prep because the mesh is already there. Now with solid and surface creations, there is a wizard that does come with SOLIDWORKS Pro and Premium that does help um, in many circumstances and the ability to prep those tools. But other than that, if you get good mesh from the source, there are a lot of opportunities to do many of the things that you saw today um, with just standard SOLIDWORKS features. But creating curves and dealing with those types of things we're doing all of that using both of those methods regardless of the acquisition of those features. So worth noting, take a look into mesh modeling if this is something that uh, is interesting to you and maybe you just have a SOLIDWORKS standard seat in order to utilize these. So we are just about 35 minutes into this so we're going to start to close here and I'll take a look up in the questions box here so if any of you do have any questions I'd like to go ahead and um, try to answer some of those if possible. You can simply put your questions into the questions tab up into the GoToMeeting. 
and uh, I'll see if I can answer those before we're finished. So while you're doing that, uh, just reiteration here, these are the reasons I might use this. Um, whether it's to try and get a whole part in my assembly just for a visual look, whether it's trying to build something that either never existed or is broken and we just want to fix it and maybe it's more of a hassle to find data than, than is necessary. Uh, I use it more often, however, to make sure that parts that I build match up with parts that exist in real life. So that's a great way to do it, especially if you never made those parts or if that data, again, is uh, not something that you can acquire. So a couple of things up in, uh, in here. Um, how big of a mesh will it take to turn into a solid? So Lenny, I've seen over the years that uh, STL data, we've had the capability to read um, STL data for quite some time. And we've always had that solid option. But prior to SOLIDWORKS 2018, any files of significance, and that's a real arbitrary statement, but really almost any file that we tried to make solid, it would have a lot of trouble with. Uh, as soon as we put the mesh model capabilities in in the last release, I have seen ridiculously large files come in uh, as mesh models, including all of the ones that I showed today. So those are, uh, it, it's, it's really sort of a hit or miss thing. There's a hardware element to this. Uh, but I haven't seen a model yet that I couldn't open before that I can't open now in SOLIDWORKS 2018. So uh, do a little bit of trial and error and see, uh, see what you can do with those. Um, question is, how did I open the mesh as a solid part? So let me go back into SOLIDWORKS and I'll just show you that little setting there. All you're doing is saying file open. In this case, you want to go ahead and make sure that you select the file type first. So we'll say mesh files and that'll bring up this options button. When you click on options, you'll have the choice of the old way or the normal way graphics body up to a surface and or automatically knit to a solid. And then there's some nuance when it comes to the mesh features themselves. If you weren't aware, this is sort of new. If you go into tools and options now, you can also get directly to these import and export settings without having to trigger a file open or a file save as. So this enables us to go to import, select the same file types. So there's my STL and the other mesh types. And then those settings will pop up here. And this will be a persistent setting. So if you switch it to solid, that's the way it'll be until you switch it off of there. All right. So as far as the rest of the questions there, um, thank you very much for some of the accolades and things here. This is a, uh, this is a recorded webinar, so I'm going to finish the uh, editing of this, and we should have this up on our YouTube channel by the end of today. So on uh, the next couple of hours. So anybody that wasn't able to see this, you'll be able to watch it again at another pace, uh, slower pace as you're trying this, or bring a colleague involved that wasn't able to join us today. So with all that said, I want to thank everybody for spending uh, half an hour of their day with me. We definitely recognize that your time is valuable, and uh, I hope we're not wasting that time. So let us know with some feedback how you're feeling about this, or have you, if you have any questions or other um, types of topics that you might want to see us focus on as well. We're always looking for hitting the mark with our customers and by you requesting things, we know that we're putting it out there for data that you want to hear. So please get a hold of us. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you very much for spending your time with us today.